Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan. My name is Khaldun Azhari. I'm a former president, and I have the honor to moderate this event today. Uh, our uh, guest today is uh, well known, and he's Ambassador Extraordinary from Bari of India to Japan, Mr. Uh, Sanjay uh, Kumar Verma. And uh, today, uh, of course, the, the issues about India and uh, in terms of strategic politics, geopolitics, and economy, and its relation to Japan, and also Corona situation, which is uh, in every news now, uh, will be uh, talked about by Mr. Ambassador. And also, we will touch upon any issues you might like to ask later in the session. Uh, today, Mr. Ambassador will give us a speech uh, for about uh, 30 minutes, and that will be followed by the uh, Q and uh, a and of course india is one of economic powers in the, in the in the world and also nuclear power and it gained the new importance recently in, in recent years as it became part of the strategy uh, designed by the united states and japan the so-called uh, indo-pacific uh, arc or uh, belt or we you name it as you wish but uh, this has uh, gained India immediate attention in Japan and the uh, United States uh, uh, among the strategic uh, makers. And I think Mr. Ambassador today will tell us how India sees this kind of uh, relationship and what are the prospects for that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, if you uh, please uh, turn off your mobile phones to the silent mode. And uh, if, if you ha have any question later, please raise your hand. Without further ado, I would like to start the session. Please welcome our main speaker, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Zari, for introducing me and introducing the, uh, setting the context. Uh, friends, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it gives me much pleasure to speak to you today at Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan. In my initial remarks, I will largely focus on discussing the evolving contours of India-Japan bilateral partnership, highlighting the role our partnership can play in the post-pandemic order in the region and, of course, beyond the region. Thereafter, I'll be open to uh, uh, your queries and questions, if there are any, and try to give you an honest response. Uh, India-Japan bilateral relations are rooted in the history and tradition, and we do enjoy a special strategic and global partnership. This partnership is based on a strong foundation of shared objectives. One of them was just mentioned by Mr. Zari, and common values such as democracy, freedom, and respect for rules of law. Next year, which is year 2022, we will mark the 70th anniversary of establishment of diplomatic relation between our two countries. As we look ahead at this important milestone, it becomes important to assess how far we have come and what role we see playing in the region and world going ahead. Our relationship today cuts across a wide range of areas with an emphasis on people-to-people -people exchanges at the core of it. Our strategic partnership is reflected in a vast array of institutional mechanisms that bind India-Japan partnership in high-level forums, such as an annual summit, a strategic dialogue, defense dialogue, two plus two ministerial dialogue, and many more. The strategic nature of India-Japan partnership is reflected in engagements such as Quad, which is India, Japan, US, Australia, uh, a foreign ministers meeting and the Quad leaders meeting uh, uh, was held a few months back. These engagements have demonstrated our commitment to our shared value of free, open, inclusive, and rules-based Indo-Pacific. Although the pandemic hindered our regular face-to-face -face interactions, frequent engagement 
between our leaders through virtual meetings. Uh, so far, three meetings have been held uh, uh, since Prime Minister Suga has taken over as the Prime Minister of Japan. And it has reaffirmed the continuity and the strength in our relationship. Japan's support to India through provision of medical equipment as we faced a surge of COVID-19 infections uh, uh, earlier last month reaffirms the depth of our relationship and indeed the partnership. Today, the COVID-19 pandemic has actually disrupted acutely the existing socioeconomic order globally and exposed supply chain vulnerabilities acting as a catalyst for receding multilateralism and weakening of the global world order. In today's fragmented, fractured, and multipolar world, the growing convergence in India-Japan strategic partnership on both geopolitics as well as economic issues has immense potential to shape a peaceful, secure, and sustainable world. Talking about the role of India-Japan partnership in ensuring post-pandemic economic recovery and role of Asia in post-COVID world, India's external affairs minister, who is the foreign affairs minister, Dr. S. Jai Shankar, at the recently held Nikkei Future of Asia conference, has said, Indo-Japan relations have a notable note, role in fact, one I would agree even beyond Asia. Our partnership is seen today as among the most natural in the region. With Indo-Pacific region becoming the center of geopolitical conversation and contestation, we are witnessing greater synergy between India and Japan's vision for the region. A strong partnership with Japan is the centerpiece of our vision in the Indo-Pacific. We see alignment between India's Act East policy, our Indo-Pacific vision based on the principles of SAGAR, S-A-G-A-R, which stands for security and growth for all in the region, and Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative, IPOI, with Japan's free and open Indo-Pacific vision. Our strong cooperation is aimed at securing end-to-end -end supply chain, reducing over-reliance on a single country and a geography, peaceful resolution of disputes, respect for international law, including those reflected in UNCLOS, and opposition to unilateral attempts to change the status quo through use of force. The Australia, India, Japan, US cooperation framework, also known as QUAD, is emerging as a reckoning platform for realizing our shared objectives in Indo-Pacific. We see Quad as a framework that brings together like-minded countries with shared values and commitment to a free and open global order based on rule of law. The positive agenda of this group was underscored at the first Quad Leaders Summit in March this year. It was decided to create three working groups on climate change, new and emerging technologies, and indeed vaccination to strengthen and assist countries in the Indo-Pacific region with vaccination. In context of the ongoing COVID-19 global pandemic, enhancing resilience of supply chains and expeditious and sustainable global economic recovery has become a necessity. In this context, the launch of Supply Chain Resilience Initiative among India, Japan, and Australia, launched in April this year, with the objective of boosting the diversification of production bases and procurement sources, and the digital management of logistics information, is an important development. India and Japan share excellent cooperation in multilateral fora and have common concerns on international peace and security issues. A myriad of challenges such as pandemic, terrorism, climate change, poverty and inequality, trade and technology, new emerging strategic technologies, 
proliferation threats, etc., continue to plague the efforts of international community to achieve sustainable development, together with peace and security. Engagement and dialogue are essential to deal with these issues, including those that have tendency to affect global strategic stability, such as nuclear disarmament, non-proliferation, and export control of chemicals and biological weapons, situation in the Middle East, and JCPOA, uh, POA, denuclearization of North Korea, demilitarization of South China Sea. Terrorism is the gravest threat to humanity. We have called for an early conclusion of the Comprehensive Convention on International Terrorism. Today, India is an active player in all important export control regimes and has an impeccable record of non-proliferation. In addition, India continues to attach high priority and remains committed to universal, non-discriminatory, and verifiable nuclear disarmament. India remains concerned on proliferation of technologies and weapons that adversely impact on its national security. India is increasingly being recognized as a net security provider in the region and is active in HADR, peacekeeping, and anti-piracy operations. India's geopolitical vision will be reflected in its work at the United Nations Security Council as a non-permanent member for the term 2021-22. At the UNSC, United Nations Security Council, India is guided by five basic principles. One, new opportunities for progress. Two, effective response to international terrorism. Three, reforming multilateral systems. Four, comprehensive approach to international peace. And fifth, security and technology with a human touch. Japan is our global partner on these critical global issues, particularly on the need of urgent UN reforms through the G4 platform and other relevant fora. As India assumes the chairship of G20 in 2022, we will further accelerate our efforts in these areas and look forward to Japan's efforts and support in taking these agenda items forward. We value and appreciate Japan's support to India-led international frameworks, such as International Solar Alliance and Coalition of Disaster Resilient Infrastructure. These initiatives are geared to work on creating global low-carbon pathways through multi-stakeholder frameworks. Our Indo-Pacific partnership has been provided a fillip with Japan's agreement to lead cooperation on the trade, connectivity, and maritime transport pillar of IPOI, one of the seven pillars of this open, non-treaty-based, inclusive platform for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific region, introduced by India in the year 2019. India and Japan frequently find themselves partnering together to ensure fair, transparent, and balanced trading systems to enhance connectivity and secure sea lanes of communication. India's commitment to combat climate change and welcome partners to create templates of sustainable development was reflected in the statement of our Prime Minister, Sri Narendra Modi, at the Leaders' Summit on Climate hosted by the United States in April this year. We see many opportunities for synergy and cooperation between Japan's green growth strategy to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050 and India's call for concrete action and bold steps on clean energy, energy efficiency, afforestation, and biodiversity. India has emerged, as most of us know, as the fastest growing major economy in the world and has become a global hub for manufacturing, innovation, and skilled manpower. Despite the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, India is now already 
set on a V-shaped recovery path with International Monetary Fund projecting 11.5% GDP growth in the year 2021. A series of administrative reforms are aimed to improve the ease of doing business in India and to level the playing field for businesses. India has risen from rank 81 to 48 in the Global Innovation Index rankings in the last five years. Risen from rank 142 to 63 in World Bank's ease of doing business rankings. The aim is to transform and build a new Atma Nirbhar Bharat, which rendered into English as a self-reliant uh, uh, new India based on five key pillars of our future economic roadmap, which include economy, infrastructure, demography, democracy, and supply chains. The government's vision is that of a US dollar five trillion economy by the year 2024. I must emphasize that our call for self-reliance should not be confused and confounded with inward-looking posture. On the contrary, it means leveraging our strong global partnerships to work on mutually beneficial outcomes. Our domestic initiatives closely relate to several targets under the SDGs and UN Agenda 2030 vision. The common theme of these programs is articulated in our slogan, Sabka Saath, Sabka Vikas, Sabka Vishwas, which means together for everyone's growth and everyone's trust. Ensuring that Agenda 2030 is mainstreamed in India's development strategy. In fact, India is at the forefront of implementing the SDGs, which is reflected in its second completed voluntary national review done in the year 2020. Japan is an important partner of India for economic growth and development. India has partnered with Japan in various national campaigns and flagship initiatives, such as Make in India, Smart Cities, Digital India, Startup India, and Invest India. The range of our economic partnerships extend into every socioeconomic sector, including infrastructure, ICT, digitalization, energy, outer space, food processing, science and technology, amongst many more. Japan has been consistently supportive of our infrastructure development, including through official development assistance loans. In fact, Japanese supported projects are among the most successful infrastructure projects in India. The landmark projects such as Delhi Metro, Mumbai Ahmedabad High Speed Rail, uh, which is also known as Shinkansen Project in India, and the Delhi Mumbai Industrial Corridor reflect our commitment for cooperation in high end technology and infrastructure development segments. Covering close to about 1,455 companies as of 2021, uh, with more than half of them in the manufacturing sector. New industrial collaborations are in the making, even as we speak. And Japan's contribution in skills enhancement is visible in 16 Japan-India institutes for manufacturing and five Japan-endowed courses in India. As a pathway for future, the dynamics of demand and supply and the complementarity between the two countries can facilitate new, innovative, and alternate modes for partnership that could be workable. To make this possible, both countries need to come together to co-innovate, co-create, and co-produce for both domestic and global markets by combining their strength and competitiveness. We do understand that both the societies have their own problems which need solutions, and therefore sitting together to co-innovate a solution would be the right way forward. Once the solutions have been co-innovated, they need to be piloted, which is co-creation. Once they have been piloted through the two societies and more, then they can be taken to the industrial phase, which is co-production. So these three pillars 
of future uh, development should be able to further strengthen India-Japan bilateral partnership. India is going to have the world's third largest construction market and aims to work for infrastructural improvement in four subgroups, civil works, track works, electrical works, and rolling stock. All these are railway-related uh, uh, projects where Japan is very much involved uh, from the urban to semi-urban and to long-distance transportation. Foreign direct investment in defense sector limit for uh, foreign investment has been increased, and we look forward to in introduction of new technologies from partner countries such as Japan in order to, again, co-produce these solutions, the main aim being to keep the region and the globe safe and peaceful. The importance of healthcare sector has never been more pronounced than now. I'm happy to let you know that India and Japan plan to collaborate on multiple aspects of healthcare, including human resources, development in the field of acute medicine, surgery, trauma care, under the Memorandum of Cooperation in the field of healthcare and wellness signed in the year 2018. This also provides the Japanese medical device manufacturers and traders to get into a market which is increasing, to get into a market which will be able to devise new solutions through the method of co-innovation and co-creation. India is the world's largest producer of vaccines. We produce close to 60% of total vaccines produced in the world. And therefore, it has 60% market share from volume point of view. Why not vol value? Because we produce very cost-effective vaccines as compared to many other manufacturers in the world. And we have emerged now as a trusted partner for international and multilateral collaboration with regard to fight against COVID-19. During the pandemic, which continues, India has been at the forefront in supplying medicines, medical kits, vaccines, nurses, doctors to more than 150 countries in the world. India has already supplied a total of more than 66 million doses of vaccines to the global community under a scheme known as Vaccine Matri, which basically means vaccine friendship. We hope that as the situation in India improves, we will be able to resume the pace of this initiative and contribute to vaccination in other countries in a larger and bigger way. India-Japan Digital Partnership was launched in 2018 to further cooperate in startups, co-innovation, corporate co-production, ESDM, again, co-innovation, co-creation, and co-production, digital talent exchange, manpower, research and development, and security-related strategic collaboration. India-Japan Digital Partnership is the cornerstone of a strong complementary and convergence digital area in view of synergies between Japan's Society 5.0 and India's Digital India, Startup India, and Skill India initiatives. With rapidly increasing active internet users in India, opportunities in frontier technologies of 5G, big data analytics, quantum technologies, quantum computing, blockchains, internet of things, telecom security, submarine optical cable uh, uh, to, to various islands of India, a spectrum management, high altitude platform for broad, broadband in unconnected areas, disaster management, public safety, are some of the promising areas. When we talk of uh, uh, the digital platform, when we talk of ICT, uh, we also want to talk about the international norm setting. Unfortunately, due to the lack of international norm setting, some of the, uh, uh, some of the countries uh, have taken upon themselves to promote unilateral norms uh, uh, for the world to, to adhere to. 
And that is something which is undesirable in a world which should be increasingly multilateral and multipolar. India is home to the third largest startup ecosystem in the world with more than 50,000 startups, which includes about 10,000 startups in the tech sector. Out of this, just to share with you, 10,000 startups were created and registered with the government in last 180 days during the peak of pandemic, which basically, if calculated, comes down to 55 startups a day. That was the pace at which startups were created. All these startups are hubs of innovation, which will, we believe, lead the world of tomorrow. Through various embassy facilitated, uh, facilitated startup initiatives, since September 2019, Japanese venture capitalists and corporations have invested in more than 100 Indian startups, infusing more than $15 billion as capital. Japan happens to be the third largest source of foreign capital for Indian startups. A private initiative, Indo-Japan Emerging Technology and Innovation, AIF, a fund of funds of about $187 million, has been launched to support India's startup ecosystem. It is a private sector initiative, and they have been able to put their money together to further leverage the power of the money in the startup ecosystem, which could help each other and indeed the world at large. Food security is another important area and has come under spotlight after the outbreak of pandemic. India's food processing sector is expected to be worth over half a trillion dollars by the year 2025. And this is a very conservative figure on the basis of the consumption of food products in India at the moment, which is at the very lower spectrum uh, uh, in the developed world or even developing world. The recent agricultural sector reforms have opened India for investment opportunities in agricultural inputs and machinery, agriculture supply chain management, ready-to-eat items, fisheries and organic produce, smart agriculture, and cold chain logistics. We have wide-ranging cooperation with Japan to promote science and technology in the areas of life sciences, material science, high energy physics, biotechnology, healthcare, methane hydrate, robotics, alternative source of energy, and earth sciences. The Indian Space Agency, known as ISRO, and JAXA, which is Japanese Space Agency, are also pursuing future cooperative activities in the use of exploration of outer space exclusively for peaceful purposes, disaster mitigation, and lunar mission. Japan is our valuable partner in climate change and energy-related initiatives. India is working to ensure that 40% of electric gen electricity generated in India is from non-fossil fuel sources by the year 2030. 38% of total installed capacity in India for electricity generation is from, uh, uh, non, uh, is from renewable energy sources, which is the non-conventional sources, uh, in which wind and solar energy plays the largest roles. Japan has also announced its target of zero greenhouse gas emission and carbon neutral society by the year 2050. Both countries need to combine innovation and technology and work closely to achieve these targets and develop research and development and production partnership in new and renewable energy sources. In addition, there is immense potential for cooperation in civil nuclear uh, area for which India and Japan signed a civil nuclear cooperation agreement in the year 2017. Indian talent, due to its technical, managerial, and financial skills, have reached to the top position of many world-class Fortune 100 companies. There are more than 12,500 Indians in Japan who are having highly skilled visa uh, uh, stamped on their passports, uh, which basically means they are, they are uh, technology providers uh, to the Japanese companies in Japan. Out of a total uh, Indian population in Japan of 40,000. 
the basic framework for partnership for proper operation of the systems pertaining to skilled, specified skilled workers, known as SSW, was also signed recently, which we believe will take the number of Indians even further uh, living in Japan and contributing to the growth and development of Japanese economy and society. Ever a strengthening component of people-to-people -people contacts through cultural exchanges, including that of yoga and Ayurveda, business-to-business -business links has been an important pillar that deepened and expanded our partnership. Samwad, a dialogue which is jointly hosted by India and Japan since the year 2014 for enhanced understanding of cultures and values of countries in the region, has promoted the idea to build the future of Asia on the positive influence of traditions of nonviolence and democracy. Common features of both the cultures happen to be a very important part and pillar of this particular joint dialogue. Such track 1.5 and track 2.0 forum will elevate the bilateral relations to new levels and strengthen their interdependence in the 21st century's new globalization for mutual benefit. As Prime Minister Narendra Modi said during Prime Minister Abe's visit to India in December 2015, and I quote, one cannot think of a strategic partnership that can exercise a more profound influence on shaping the course of Asia and our interlinked ocean regions than ours. Unquote. Thus, India-Japan multifaceted partnership is shaping the contours of the regional peace, stability, and prosperity, and has therefore been rightly regarded as a partnership for delivering global goods. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for listening to me. Arigato gozaimasu. Thank you. Namaskar. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for this uh, comprehensive presentation. Uh, that shed a uh, lot of light about uh, India and its uh, relations. I would like to start the Q&A session. If you have any question, please re raise your hand, Anthony. Please proceed to the front desk. <coughs> Uh, Anthony Rowley, I write for the South China Morning Post and other publications. Mr. Ambassador, the Asia region in general is being increasingly divided or bifurcated into two regions, the Asia-Pacific region in which China figures very largely and the Indo-Pacific region. Just generally, don't you, doesn't this worry you that the, the longer this division continues and the deeper it becomes, that the greater the chances of confrontation and possibly even, you know, conflict uh, grow in the future. And the second part of my question is, India is a founding shareholder of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, one of the biggest shareholders, I think. And I believe you're also a very strong supporter of what's known as the Blue Dot Initiative, which has just been launched, uh, United States, um, Japan, and Australia, which many people see as a counter to the Belt and Road Initiative. Don't you feel rather torn or split between these the, the, these two um, uh, organizations to which you belong. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting questions, I must say. Uh, there is no conflict between the concept of Indo-Pacific and Asia-Pacific, which is an old concept. In fact, Indo-Pacific has become the new currency as compared to the old currency, which used to be Asia-Pacific. So therefore, I will not like to compare them. One more or less replaces the other. So in my view, Indo-Pacific replaces Asia-Pacific today. Uh, if, if one just studies the ocean rim of Indian Ocean and Pacific Ocean, one will be able to uh, make out that Asia-Pacific is very much included in Indo-Pacific concept. Uh, so if they are, they are not two different concepts, and Indo-Pacific is more inclusive than Asia-Pacific, then I would say the probabilities of conflict, which you mentioned, would automatically get diminished. The, the principles remain the same. The principles are the same of inclusiveness, principle of rules of law, principles of 
abiding by the international commitment, principles of not thrusting your wish on others by being aggressive and forceful. All these things are common. And these are the principles which need to be followed in any architecture, loose architecture or an architecture having an international organization would remain the same. And we believe that Indo-Pacific vision, which many countries share, not only India and Japan, but in ASEAN region as well, uh, many countries do share uh, on the other side of the Pacific, US shares the same, Australia shares the same. So there are many countries beyond Asia, uh, uh, which also share. And when you look at the Indian Ocean side, it goes up to Africa. The Eastern rim of Africa is on Indian Ocean. So therefore, it's a large enough uh, 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 a confluence of seas, which, which is what Prime Minister Abe said it. So it's large enough a confluence of seas, uh, which, which can uh, take things forward uh, uh, in, in creating a more harmonious and peaceful region, as far as geography is concerned. On Asia uh, Infrastructure Bank, yes, we have a large stake there. And uh, we want it to be promoted with a view to serve uh, uh, its stakeholders, of course, but also the beneficiaries. And these beneficiaries are largely at the moment in Indo-Pacific region who understand the meaning of inclusiveness, who understand the meaning of establishment of peace uh, uh, in the region. Belt, of, Belt and Road Initiative, India had never been a part of it. We are one of very few countries who refused to be a part of Belt and Road Initiative right from its inception. And therefore, it will be, uh, uh, it will be inappropriate for me to comment on a forum where we are not present. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, and on the G7, where we, the, the leaders talked about Build Better, uh, uh, we, we have already voiced our support uh, for that concept uh, when our prime minister participated through virtual mode with all other G7 leaders uh, uh, in, the, in the summit. I hope I was able to respond to your queries. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just ask a question uh, I received online, and then I get back to you. It's from uh, Simon Denner from the Washington Post. Uh, he says, India was a founder of the non-aligned movement and uh, now, uh, by joining the Quad and the uh, Free and Open uh, Indo-Pacific, uh, uh, it looks uh, as though India is siding with the US and Asian democracies to resist China's territorial ambitions together. Is that fair? That's the question. Thank you. Thank you very much. A very pertinent query, which I have heard from many other uh, uh, thinkers on international politics. Uh, Let's first of, all, first of all look at NAM. Non-aligned movement had its name as non-alignment for a reason, because it gave the choice of independent foreign policy to all its members. India being one of the founding members of, uh, of non-aligned movement had the same thing in, on its mind. And even today, Quad does not force us to leave or give up our independent foreign policy. It is autonomous. It, it has autonomy uh, of the sovereignty. And it has complete independence. It does not preclude the convergence of principles. So Quad has certain principles which have a convergence and reverberance with the Indian foreign policy ethos. And that is very much there. So whenever we have a difference, which is bound to be there whenever two or more countries are together, these, uh, these differences are to be voiced in the most democratic manner. So democracy is another principle. Peace is third principle, non-proliferation. So you can take these principles and you will find that in Quad, the countries which have come together, they all follow these principles. And therefore, there is an architecture. And therefore, there is a dialogue. And therefore, there are deliverables coming out of Quad. So I do not see Quad going against the philosophy and principle of having an independent foreign policy by a country. Indo-Pacific. You know, Indo-Pacific had been there for a long time. I mean, let me just take you a little bit 
in the past, when Swami Vivekananda, a, a great uh, Indian philosopher, uh, when he traveled to the uh, Parliament of World Religions in Chicago, he traveled through Japan. And he stayed here for a week, 10 days. And he mentioned the word confluence of two seas. And that is what has been now transformed into Indo-Pacific region. So it is for India, Indian culture, Indian heritage, Indian tradition, Indian ethos, it is not a new word. It had always been there. And we also include another one, uh, uh, which, is the, which um, uh, indicates the inclusiveness of India. It's known as Vasudhav Kutumbakam, which basically means the entire world, entire earth is one family. So therefore, inclusiveness, the concept of inclusiveness comes from there. So there is no contradiction in India being a member of non-aligned movement and India being a member of Quad, sharing the vision of Indo-Pacific. So from our perspective, we do not see any uh, contradiction, and we will continue on this path. Thank you. Thank you. So China has nothing to do with that, uh, Ambassador, I think. OK. Uh, just uh, another question, uh, uh, Mr. Manami, uh, Mitani Hanaka, uh, son from TBS, is asking, how do you see the Tokyo Olympics? Do you think it is possible to hold the games? Thank you. Uh, I will go by what is there uh, uh, officially conveyed. And yes, Tokyo Olympics, according to the official communications, is going ahead with. Our athletes are eagerly waiting to come and join the event and try to do the best they can uh, uh, in the sporting event. We also heard from the G7 leaders yesterday, including our own prime minister, as a special invitee, that we look forward to the Tokyo Olympics. Olympics should generally be held on time so that the, the uh, 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 Athletes who would participate in it, participate in it, they do not get disappointed. It's a global event. It's an event for which the world waits for four years. And therefore, our view is that with safety as the paramount, so that health issues are not compromised, neither for the athletes, nor for other visitors, nor for the Japanese residents uh, uh, in Tokyo and other cities. While keeping that as the most important factor, we believe that Olympics should go ahead with. And I'm sure, given the precautions with uh, uh, the Japanese government and the Japanese Olympic Committee, is taking together with the International Olympic Committee, uh, we do not foresee any difficulty in going ahead with the Olympics. Thank you. Just follow up, how many athletes coming from India? <laughs> I'm, I'm sure it's a sport question related, but uh, you know. it's The number is increasing because some of the qualifying events are still uh, uh, not held. Uh, but at the moment, it is close to about 140 athletes. Thank you. James, please proceed. James Coe from the Air Force University. And uh, so I have a question. I, I'm a scientist, actually. Uh, I work in various technology areas. But uh, one of the things I'm very concerned about, uh, in, in, in the sciences, as you know, we are very internationally minded. That is, we work with all kinds of ethnicities and different kinds of people. But one of the questions I think that we all face, you've talked about some of the external threats that India, its allies, and the world face, the environment covered, and of course, uh, uh, external enemies. But what about the internal enemies? I mean, we're seeing populist movements, nationalist movements, chauvinistic movements, I mean, ethnicity-based extremists in, in, in many countries, including the United States, as you well know. And what 
and, and there are people who argue that, that an autocratic system can, is more efficient than a democratic system. And there are people that say, well, China can do things faster, cheaper, and better than India, which requires time to move. I mean, I've been going to Kolkata sometimes and for the past uh, maybe 15 years, and I've seen the metro being built to the airport, and it's still not finished. And I guess China could do it in a year or two. So I would, I would like to ask you, how, what is your answer to, to these questions? How can democratic countries answer and deal with these extremist, internal extremist and anti-democratic movements? And how can we convince other countries on the borderline that, that democracy is the best system despite the appeal of sometimes of autocratic systems doing things faster, cheaper, and better? Thank you. Thank you very much. Very fascinating query. Uh, you are uh, a scientist and a scientific reporter. I tried to become a scientist 32 years back, but here I am. Uh, the internal enemies are there everywhere. And uh, it doesn't matter how small or large country is. But the main principle which I see in all of them is that there has to be a democracy of dialogue. Unless there is a dialogue with them, if they are enemies, they cannot get converted into seeing the convergence of the interest. And therefore, the democracies uh, uh, would work towards working together with, even with the, as you quote, said, and I quote you basically, internal enemies. Uh, uh, there could be other terms to define them, but uh, 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 they are the ones who do not uh, uh, see a convergence with, with the policies of the government of the day. Uh, and therefore, not necessarily that they are enemies. They may be able to give a couple of good points to, to the uh, governing, uh, uh, to the, to the uh, political parties which are governing at that point of time. As far as the autocratic system is concerned, we have to decide whether we want to surrender our human rights and earn money which which a person can earn uh, without having any dignity at all. So while not surrendering our human rights, having enough dignity in the society and our lives and within ourselves, if we have to move forward, democracy is the only way at it. Autocratic systems may or may not be able to do that. So if we want a temporary peak in the happiness, if I can call it, then of course autocratic systems may be able to give you a kick from the alcohol of autocracy in a shorter time. But if we look at our lifelong perspective, then democracy will be able to give a much averaged out, but yet a much long lasting happiness to all of us. That will be my response to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Are we Uh, Obayashi is my name, freelance. Uh, my, my question is, uh, how do you evaluate the recent uh, European country's decision to send the warships or aircraft carrier to the uh, Indo-Pacific region? Uh, actually, not at all. Uh, we, what the way in which we see it, any defense-related bilateral exercise is just one of the tools of the foreign policy. And therefore, by doing such exercises, the two sides are developing better understanding about each other, whether it is the command system of the two different systems, whether it is the equipment, whether these are the philosophies of the two sides uh, uh, in creating a defensive system. So all these form uh, uh, a milieu for developing a better understanding between the two sides. So uh, I do not see it as a threat at all. And at the same time, it also tells those powers and countries which 
are not conforming to their international commitments and uh, uh, the rules of law. That these countries are together in defending the basic international tenets to provide security and peace in the region. So I think it's a political messaging, it's a diplomatic messaging, and such exercises should not uh, be considered as any threat to any region. It's not a follow-up, follow actually, but um, it, India, along with China, um, Indonesia, even the United States and Japan, is one of the biggest uh, emitters of CO2 gases, especially from coal-burning uh, power, uh, power plants. Now, certain people, experts like Lord David Howell, for instance, from UK, argue that whatever these countries say by way of pledges in Glasgow or wherever, they are not simply not going to be able to meet their um, targets for reducing CO2 emissions. Um, do you agree? And if you disagree, why do you disagree? Can you say why? Thank you. I, I, uh, there's no black and white answer to this. There is no zero one. It's not a binary. Uh, CO2 emission is a problem. All of us know it very well. Uh, many of us have committed to reduce. As far as India's reduction commitment is concerned, it is there. It is well on track. In fact, it is uh, more than being on the track. Uh, as I earlier talked about the renewable energy, 38% of India's total electricity generation is from the renewable energy, and I'm not counting the electricity generated from nuclear energy, which could also be seen as a clean energy source. So if we take that as well, then the percentage moves up even further. So I have no doubts that we will be able to keep to our commitments uh, uh, and, in fact, go beyond that uh, uh, while being there. Target setting in the international community is an ambition. So there should not be any dissuasion from countries setting their targets. Sometimes these targets may or may not be met. If they are not met, there should be more international cooperation to help those countries to meet their targets. So I will not say that targets should not be set. I will not say that a country, if it is not able to meet the target by a percent or two percent uh, or percentage points. The country is uh, uh, at, uh, uh, at loggerheads or at divergence with its uh, commitment because after all, there has to be a trend and if a trend is fine, uh, uh, I, I would say the countries are doing well enough. Uh, the, the gaps has to be fulfilled through international cooperation. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for various things. Actually, I did not understand that Swami Vivekananda came here yes. in Japan. your name and for, affiliation. Oh, well, <laughs> I am one of your 40,000 Indians that you mentioned in your talk. And uh, I'm Shashwati Banerjee. And I'm here for 20 years, and I am also contributing to Japanese uh, technology sector, as you mentioned. But my interest, because especially because I'm Indian, so my interest is also a little bit in the domestic affairs. Foreign relations are fine. For example, what I was a little bit uh, worried about, I saw when I was in India this in December, I saw that the country was doing pretty well, actually, from this COVID and pandemic point of view. Now, what I was surprised is in April, or maybe late March or something, India suddenly featured very well in world news, in international news. I mean, I was uh, hearing this on NPR constantly, that they were saying that India is in a huge chaos. So what it, this pandemic did is it brought out the problems in India's health sector. I think uh, maybe, uh, I mean, this is my understanding of the situation. And as you mentioned that you are, uh, there is some understanding with the Japanese side on this health sector. And I would really like to see that uh, some improvement in the health sector, basically. So that's one thing. And so I think another thing I would like to, s 
hear from you that as a country, as a nation, as a democratic country, and with all the diversities that we have, so what, I mean, what lesson did we learn from this huge pandemic with a billion plus population and in 2020, what lessons did we learn and what are we going to do in our future to avoid this situation, this entire chaos that I would ask you? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it is not only a domestic uh, question, it is also it also has implications for international questions. Yeah, by December we were doing very well. Frank, um, we were doing, we were uh, being uh, 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 mentioned as one of the best performing countries in the world, uh, as far as the COVID pandemic is concerned. Uh, by March, uh, the second wave was already in, and therefore the infectability of the virus was high, and people were getting infected, so much so that in uh, uh, by mid of May we had. Uh, one of the days when the figure is spiked to 411,000 a day uh, uh, of infection. Uh, the infectability for a country of 1.4 billion people, approximately, uh, any infection is bad, any death is bad, any death is wrong, frankly. Uh, but uh, if you calculate it per million population, India was uh, still the 108th country in the world on the basis of number of infections per million. If you calculate the number of deaths, again, let me clarify, any death is, should not happen. Any premature death should not happen. But if you see uh, uh, the total number of deaths, I'm talking about mid-May. Uh, uh, India was about 113th country from the top uh, on death per million. So on, on uh, uh, that side, we were not doing too bad. We were okay. It was a pandemic, and that pandemic has hit everyone. Uh, so it, it is a pandemic. Uh, uh, at that time, it was rising in India. But if you look at the curve, the curve has, has come down very quickly in the second wave. First wave, it was more elong elongated, which means it, it was there. And therefore, when it is an elongated curve, the existing medical system, which was supposed to take care of the normal illness of people, 1.4 billion of them, uh, was still able to handle it. But when you have a peak coming too soon, then any medical system in the world, any, will falter. So our system also faltered. Uh, uh, given that we are a developing country, we do not have as deep a pocket as many of the developed countries. Yes, uh, uh, we did need more international cooperation in order to tidy it up. Now, as on the 14th of June, which was yesterday. Now, let me give you the figures for you to understand uh, and analyze yourself whether uh, the government of India and the medical system in India, health system in India, has been able to cap it up. The total COVID-19 infections all through the entire pandemic is about 29.5 million out of 1.4 billion people. Active cases as on today is only 0 0.97 million which means everyone else got better and went home. So that is the positive story which uh, you mentioned a particular news uh, uh, um, or media. Unfortunately, those stories are missed out. And the stories which could be sensationalized is picked up. But that's, that's, uh, uh, that's the role of media to, to let us know as to where we have faltered, and that's fine. The, so 3.30% of total cases uh, are active cases as on today. 95.43% have already become better, discharged, and gone home. The total death is only 1.27% of the cases, which reduce, gets reduced to about 370,000 deaths. Again, just to, just to balance it, any death is regrettable. But it's pandemic, it happened. Uh, so, if you if you look from that perspective, uh, the per million uh, cases today uh, in India is better than many of the countries you won't like to uh, uh, compare it with. To give you an example, in the U.S., 
it is much higher. It is almost five times higher than India. If you look at UK, it is three times higher than India. France, about four times higher than India. Germany, twice higher than India. So what I mean is all those countries have done very well to control whatever they have been able to control. But there is a limitation to any medical system in the world. And that limitation will not allow you to take care of the entire number of infected people. Second question, which you did not ask, but I must respond to you, is whether India was doing enough testing. India had conducted more than 400 million tests till now. So therefore, testing was not deficient. And therefore, the figures that you see of infection, they have come through the testing process itself. So there is no hidden uh, uh, fact there. Uh, I can go on and on on this, but uh, I don't want to sort of uh, take uh, much more time than this. Vaccination, sorry, one last point. When you look at vaccination, in last seven days, the total number of doses of vaccine India has administered is close to 3.5 million doses a day. Yesterday, it was a bit different, and it was 3.9 million doses administered in a day. So we are trying our best. Of course, the best solution would have been to vaccinate the entire population in a day, which is not feasible. Uh, uh, so we are moving forward. And so far, we, are, we have been able to uh, uh, vaccinate uh, uh, close to about 256 million people. I think that gives you some perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Tom, last question. I extend a little bit, a uh, few minutes, Ambassador. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador uh, Th Thomas Sullivan, uh, uh, Associate Member, thank you very much for uh, your, spe your speech today. Just wanted to ask you two quick questions. You talked about a lot of the geopolitical issues today, the G7, the Indo-Pac, et cetera. But in your near abroad, um, you've got a 1,500 kilometer border with Myanmar. Could you give me um, uh, or let us know uh, what, what the Indian government position is on what is unfolding in, or what, what has unfolded, unfolded in Myanmar since the 1st of February? Uh, and just secondly, uh, you talked about India's commitment to technology and ICT. Uh, I am a, a WhatsApp user. As you may know, India is the largest WhatsApp market uh, in the world, I think 450 million users. Uh, but I think the Indian government is now asking for access to you know, people's messages, et cetera. Again, I, I wonder, could you try to explain to us what, what is happening there? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you for your questions. Uh, geopolitically, India is very active, and it needs to be active, uh, having one-sixth of world's population, and therefore one-sixth or more of world's interest as well. Myanmar is our neighboring country, and therefore anything which happens within Myanmar and could have a post or cross-border implication will remain in, uh, uh, important for us. In Myanmar, we have been formally and informally talking to both sides. Uh, we have urged uh, the uh, military uh, junta, which is there at the moment, uh, to release all the political prisoners and support any uh, attempt to resolve the current uh, situation. We have already gone and supported the five-point consensus reached uh, within the ASEAN, and uh, 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 which was, I think, in April, sometime later April. Uh, and uh, uh, we are trying to sort of sue things together. We are also one of the witnesses of the uh, ethnic armed organizer EAO, e e uh, uh, which was uh, a few years back, and uh, uh, with Japan. Japan is also a witness there. So we, we are also trying to find out if there could be any other track which will have a larger traction to resolve the issues which are there today. Uh, we have time and again talked about the restoration of rule of law, restoration of the uh, provisions of the Constitution of Myanmar. Uh, we have offered our assistance wherever we can, being a neighboring country and being a country which has got uh, historical links with Myanmar, beyond which uh, 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 we will be there to uh, collaborate with other international partners for a positive 
uh, uh, forward movement. Uh, we are not necessarily looking at punishing the country. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful place. And uh, uh, the, this is not the first time that Myanmar has a military uh, ruled government. Uh, last, last time when it was there, we did play uh, the role that we required to play at that time as well for, uh, for uh, the, the democratic uh, institutions in Myanmar. And we are ready to do the same again. Thank you. Uh, WhatsApp, sorry, I missed out. Uh, most, most places it is a bit misreported. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you what is there in the Act. Act talks about appointing a grievance redressal officer, which means that there should be someone in WhatsApp India to whom the government or anyone else, not only government, anyone else who has a, got a grievance against whatever in WhatsApp, uh, uh, they are not content creators, so I will not go into the contents, but anything to do with the WhatsApp. Uh, whom should he approach? Should he approach the compliance officer sitting in the US, who is under the US jurisdiction and not under the Indian jurisdiction? But if a product is uh, rolled out in India, should that, not product, should that product not be held responsible if it is breaching any of the Indian laws? It is true for all countries. Why it, is it only WhatsApp? By the way, I, I also use WhatsApp a lot. Uh, why is it only WhatsApp which has raised such a hue and cry? Twitter is already doing that. Facebook is already doing that. They have India compliance officers. So why is it that, that just that one company? Uh, because probably there was some misunderstanding for them. And uh, there are dialogues on. Uh, and. Uh, 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 we wanted them to come on the same level playing field as any other TOT uh, players in India uh, as soon as possible. So I'm sure that uh, they, will, they will, through the dialogue, they will be able to come back to the fold of Indian laws and we will be able to do the justice to our own system. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Rema. This wraps up our event. You gave us great uh, insights for uh, the situation, and we, I'm sure we have more questions, and I hope we can meet you again. But this time, we would like to meet you in the bar. That's why I'm giving you, Mr. Ambassador, a uh, free honorary membership Thank you very to much. our uh, club. All ambassadors have such um, uh, honorary, but I give you now because uh, you. we haven't done. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thanks so Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming, and uh, please. Uh, have a nice evening. Thanks. Thank you.